Hey everybody! Um, welcome to the first ever food history uh, happy hour. Um, this is my first ever live stream, so bear with me if things go sideways. Um, and I realize it's not eight o'clock. I just couldn't wait anymore. <laughs> I was making myself nervous. So, all right, now it's 8 o'clock. Um, so if you guys enjoy this little live stream, this will be the first of a couple. Um, I think I have four scheduled so far on the Facebook event. And um, as long as we're on, on pause, as the governor of New York says, um, I will keep doing these if you guys want me to. So we'll just hang out, I guess, wait for anybody to show up. I don't know how it tells me that. So I'm going to do some scrolling. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing a bunch of people liking my other posts, but nobody on the live stream so far. Ironic. Um, so anyway, I don't really know what I'm doing. Sarah Lippin, hello! Thank you so much for joining us. That makes me feel very special. Um, yay! People are watching. <sighs> That's so great. Um, I think I'm just going to go ahead and get started with my cocktail that I'm going to make tonight. Um, as you can see, I have all of my cocktail things out. I'm not a big cocktail drinker, but I do enjoy the occasional adult beverage, as we like to say. Um, for those of you who checked out the event page, I did post the recipe that I'm going to be making tonight. It's um, from a bartender's guide from the Hoffman House restaurant in 1912. Uh, and the thing I'm going to be making is called a Hoffman House Fizz. Um, it calls for lemon juice. Um, powdered sugar, Plymouth gin, now this is not Plymouth gin, this is American gin, but it's very similar. Um, Plymouth gin is different from London dry gin in that it's not as dry, not the Hoffman House in Kingston, sadly. <laughs> different Hoffman House, I believe in New York City. I couldn't find out that much about it, actually, other than what was in, um, what was in the little bartender's guide there. Um, but so Plymouth gin is very old gin. It dates back to the mid 18th century. Um, it's a little bit sweeter than London dry gin, which is what most people are familiar with. Like if you've ever had beef eater or anything like that, Tanqueray, that kind of thing. Um, so Blue Coat is an American style gin. It's called Blue Coat because of uh, the American Revolution, so of course we have to have this because my husband is a Revolutionary War <laughs> historian. That's why we got it. Um, but it's actually very good. I did not like gin until I had this kind of gin. So calls for gin. Um, it also calls for cream. What cream? And a siphon, which uh, was basically seltzer water. And I don't have regular. I only have a lemon lime. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, Sarah, I feel so bad that you're here by your lonesome, but if you have any questions, obviously you can ask me along the way. So we're going to start out, I have just a very basic martini shaker. Uh, I have my awesome little vintage ice bucket. We're going to put some ice cubes in. Just a couple because it's not a lot of gin. Um, and I don't want to dilute it too much. All right, so the really cool thing that I love that I'm kind of excited to show you about, and I'm sorry this is such a small space, I'm on my porch, so I'm going to put this over here. Hi, Carla and Glenn. <laughs> um, this is my favorite, one of my favorite things ever. It's called a Juice-O-Matic, and how it works is you crank this little handle on the side, and it kind of looks like an alien. 
right from the movie. And it's got this little thing that comes, comes out, these pieces that come out. Um, and it's for squeezing citrus juice and citrus fruit. And then I got a little Pyrex cup in the bottom here to catch it. So um, before we had, you know, commercially produced orange juice, if you wanted fresh squeezed orange juice in the morning, you would use your juice o So feeling very stabby, just kidding. So I've been lemon. It calls for the juice of half a lemon. So we're gonna be real accurate and just do half a lemon and you stick it in like that, right? And then you crank the handle down. It gets a little tough, you have to kind of hold on to it. But it's a very efficient way of squeezing citrus juice. Look at all that juice coming out. Hi, Andy. What you would you say? That's where you work. Where do you work? And holy crap, is it an automatic one or a handheld one like this one? So anyway, ta-da! There's the lemon, all squished. So I really like using it because um, not only is it fun to operate and really efficient, but um, it also gets some of the lemon oil in there, which you don't really get as much if you are just squeezing it with your hand or using a reamer or whatever. So, all right. So we have our martini shaker with a couple of ice cubes in there. We've got our lemon juice. I really hope this is good, you guys. This is a lot of work and it's not very good. Um, okay, it calls for half a teaspoon. So I'm guesstimating here half a teaspoon of powdered sugar. Um, a jigger of rum. There we go. So I have my jigger. Sorry, I said a jigger of rum. I totally meant a jigger of gin. I promise I didn't start drinking before I started this. All right, there's our jigger of gin. And now we need our teaspoon of cream, which is good because I'm almost out of cream. Teaspoon of cream. I hope it doesn't curdle. We'll find out. All right, so. Shakey, shakey. Now, it didn't say what kind of glass to serve this in, um, but the directions did say to pour it with siphon, which means that you have to pour it simultaneously. So I'm gonna make some room here. Bye bye, juice automatic. So we're gonna see how talented I am at pouring two at the same time. Okay, are you ready? This is kind of slippery because it's been out. Wait, I should put I should put an ice cube in. I'm gonna put some ice in. <laughs> Sorry, delayed climax, right? This probably would have been um, a lot prettier if I had done it in like an old-fashioned champagne glass or something, but when you're adding uh, seltzer, you can't really do that. So, here we go. That looks kind of delightful. Okay, people. Moment of truth. What do you think it's going to taste like? I don't know. Any guesses? Creamy and lemony, I'm guessing. Let's take a sip. You can't really taste the cream at all. Just kind of tastes like lemon juice and gin, to be honest with you. <laughs> Bubbly lemon juice and gin. A little bit like a gin and tonic, but less bitter. You can get a little hint of the cream. 
I probably would put more cream in, if I was going to do it again, to be honest. It's extremely refreshing. Um, so there we have it. The Hoffman House Fizz. So I'm now going to drink this. Um, and it's your guys' responsibility to ask me questions. So I took up 10 minutes <laughs> of this video. Um, so does anybody have any questions for me? Let me see if I can scroll. Am I missing people? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I missed all these questions. I thought it would post automatically. All right, Carla wants to know how old, what, the juicer is? I don't know, probably the 50s. Hi, Kat Anna Catherine. <laughs> Hi, Erin. It is very stylish. Um, I think a jigger, Carl asked how much is a jigger. I think it's about an ounce-ish, an ounce-ish. Um, Annie posts, I've never had a sherbet beverage. I've just had the ice cream-like substance. Um, so I'm now scrolled all the way down so I can see your questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> As we said, this is a learning experience for me. Um, is anybody else joining me with an adult beverage tonight? What are you guys drinking? Anything interesting? No? No one? <laughs> you had so many good questions, and now there's just silence. So, I don't know what you guys want to talk about. Um, I'm not done with my book. We could talk about that, despite the fact that, uh, that um, I have a lot of free time on my hands right now. Oh, Carla, where did the name Jigger come from? I have no idea. I have no idea. This is the problem with these, is people are gonna ask me questions I don't know the answer to. Um, someone else can Google it. <laughs> Carla, you can Google it, you're on a computer. <laughs> oh, Andy's drinking tea, very prohibition appropriate. Erin is drinking a glass of 2% milk. Wow, okay. That's fine, that's fantastic. It's very wholesome of you. Glenn is also drinking milk. Lots of milk drinkers, that surprises me. I mean, I can't really say anything because I put cream in my alcohol, so. Sarah's having a very sweet wine. Is it, do you enjoy sweet wine? I usually enjoy sweet wine, not always though. Um, somebody mentioned Prohibition. I don't know if anybody saw my Prohibition blog post, um, but we're in the anniversary year of the start of Prohibition. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> Why are you drinking wine you don't like, Sarah? Leftover from Shabbos? Okay. Because you don't want to waste it. I'm one of those people too. Um, so as I was saying, it's the anniversary of Prohibition, which started in January of 1920. So it's the 100th anniversary. Um, and the more I learn about Prohibition, um, the more interesting it gets. I think most people tend to think of Prohibition as just, um, you're so funny, Sarah, um, as the more crime-ridden parts of it, speakeasies and beer trucks and rum running and bootlegging and stuff like that. Um, but when the reason why prohibition was enacted is because a pretty large majority of the country thought that it was a great idea, that alcohol was terrible and ruining lives and, you know, we could do without it. Um, but what they didn't realize was that a very small, not so small portion of the United States really, really liked alcohol. <laughs> Um, and they basically created a tax-free money laundering scheme where anybody who get their hands on alcohol could make a lot of money. Um, and it, crime basically flourished on the black market. Okay, Andy has a question. When was the pint legally set in the United States as a 16-ounce beverage? Huh, I'm asking because apparently in Canada where they use imperial units, 16 fluid ounces is a different amount anyway. So there is no legal definition. Um, hmm, that is a very good question. Uh, my understanding is that a pint is a standardized measurement. Um, of course, my 
experience with pints is with canning jars that are pints and not with pints of beer. Um, but that's a very good question. I'm going cleverly. I also have my phone. Um, so I'm gonna look it up right now because you're making me curious. Um, and we're gonna see what we come up with. Carla says I have an international audience. Who else is watching? Can I see? <laughs> Becca says, Ian says jigger is a shot. Yeah, shots and jiggers are about the same. Um, same measurement. And it is a measurement. Oh, interesting. Interesting, Andy. A pint is a unit of liquid or dry capacity equal to one half of a quart. Yeah, imperial measurements. They're just the best. Oh, Gabrielle's watching. Hi, Gabrielle. Um, so there you have a half a quart. Quart is a qu quarter of a gallon. <laughs> uh, yeah, not a lot of logic to imperial measurements, I guess, or whatever we call the non-metric system. That's really terrible that I don't know that. But does anybody else have any other history questions? or want to chat about anything. COVID-19 is why we're doing this. I live in New York. It's pretty terrible right now, although I'm relatively safe and healthy. So there's that. But uh, I am on the front porch of my house. People who've come to parties at my house, lucky you, have been here. It's like the best part of the house. Um, little screen porch. I have all the windows down because otherwise a, you could see the reflection of my computer, and B, you could see the 8 million cars driving by the front of my house right now. So, anyway, anybody want to talk about anything else? Hi, Gabrielle. Bonjour. Bonsoir. <laughs> Ça va? We do have an international audience now. Gabrielle is from Canada. Quebec. Quoi? She is. What was a popular snack during the Spanish flu? So I'm actually working on a kind of depressing blog post, which is why it's not done yet, because with all the stuff going around about COVID-19, it's stressful to write. But I'm writing a blog post about food during the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. Um, and the answer is there's not that much information about food during the pandemic. Um, in part because there's not that much like casual everyday information about the pandemic. Um, from what I found, one of the reasons why there's not a lot of information is because hospitals weren't really centralized medicine in 1918 the way they are now. They were starting to get that way and we were really making a lot of strides in epidemiology um, at the turn of the 20th century in the United States, we really lagged behind for a long time in the 19th century. The rest of Europe was way ahead of us until basically the turn of the 20th century. And then we kind of took some leaps forward. Um, but invalid cookery, um, is, was pretty much unchanged from the late 19th century to really the 1930s and 40s. Um, so it was a lot of people, you know, serving you beef tea and blanc mange and barley water. And a new one in the 19 teens was albumin water, which was made with egg whites. Um, so it's supposed to be really digestible stuff. Um, so, you know, otherwise popular snack, I think would have been whatever was popular during the war before Spanish flu, right? Whatever you can make. Um, so going back to the hospital thing, part of the reason why there's not a ton of information is because a lot of people were caring for the sick in their own homes. Um, and women in particular were sort of tasked with providing nursing care and nutrition for the people who were sick in their own homes. And because the Spanish flu focused mainly on young, healthy adults, it took out a lot of breadwinners. Um, so the 
some records that do exist talk about you know, like relief for the poor, uh, voluntary organizations that work with the poor, talking about after Spanish flu, you know, tens of thousands of more people in New York City going on their relief aid because they'd lost their breadwinner or were still recovering. Um, but a lot of it was you kind of had to rely on the kindness of strangers. Um, and once the Spanish flu really got going, people weren't necessarily that interested. Um, in helping each other because they were too scared. Uh, so there are some instances of people, you know, bringing food or food being made in large community kitchens so it can be delivered. Um, but yeah, sorry, Andy, no specifics. Oh, Aaron wants to know about goulash, American goulash, or as my mother-in-law calls it, um, country goulash, which is basically ground beef, macaroni, and tomatoes. I'm gonna take a sip, guys. It really is pretty good. You should try it. Um, so this is the time that we get American goulash is kind of in the 19 teens, 20s, definitely into the 30s and 40s. Um, Americans had a tendency to take immigrant foods and sort of bring them down to their most basic, blandest <laughs> ingredients. Um, so ground beef, macaroni, and tomatoes with or without paprika, um, or in the case of how my mother-in-law makes it, tomato ketchup, which is actually surprisingly delicious. Um, but ground beef and macaroni and canned tomatoes were widely available. You might can your own tomatoes, you might, buy, you might purchase them. Um, but it was an easy dish, and I personally think, um, that by calling it goulash, you know, you're sort of putting a little bit of posh, polish, class on what is a very basic dish. Um, Andy mentioned American chop suey, very similar, except for it's with, I believe it's ground beef with green uh, pepper and onion and noodles and soy sauce. So that's like, not really Asian. You're like, what makes it Asian? Oh, we put some soy sauce in it. What makes it Hungarian? Oh, we put some paprika in it. You know, there's also at this time something called tamale pie, which is Mexican only by the faintest smidge of, um, you know, passing glance of Mexican food. It's basically ground beef with tomatoes and onions, and then you put cornmeal mush on top and you bake it. Um, so it's, slightly resembles a tamale because you've got the cooked cornmeal on top, but that's pretty much where the similarity ends. And yet, again, it takes on this aura of being something um, interesting or sophisticated and not just ground beef with a couple of things you already had around the house. So yes, goulash, American chow suey, tamale pie, all related, <laughs> all part of this you know, Americanization trend of taking immigrant food waste um, and making them bland. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's what we did. Part of it had to do with the availability, you know, what was available. Um, you know, people didn't necessarily have access to a variety of Asian ingredients or they don't necessarily have access to real Hungarian paprika. Um, <laughs> Apparently I gave Aaron an idea for tamale pie for supper tomorrow. I've actually never made it. I kind of want to, and maybe I will now that I'm home all the time and have to cook three meals a day. But yeah, that's actually, um, there's this really interesting little cookbook that I'll see if I can track down and I'll post in the comments or in the event page. Um, and it's basically invalid food for various immigrant groups. It's written in 1923 by a woman who was trying to convince hospitals that you can't serve immigrants, communities, um, like Anglo-American invalid food because they don't recognize it and they won't eat it. And if they won't eat it, then they're not going to get better. Um, <laughs> okay, Aaron and Chad are making tamale pie, but they're putting chilies in it to make it more authentically Mexican. Um, but anyway, so this little cookbook 
has just about every immigrant community you can think of at the time listed in it. And it's taking, if Chad's going to the freezer now, it takes, um, you know, the same basic nutritional concepts as beef tea and blanc mange and stuff like that, um, but uses uh, ingredients that immigrant communities would be more familiar with. So, you know, instead of making oatmeal or cream of wheat for, you know, Mexican Hispanic immigrants, it would be cornmeal mush, you know, or stuff like that. Um, so it's a really interesting little book. I don't think she got much traction um, with people in village cookery, you know, in hospitals was not really a high priority. Still isn't, sadly, uh, having been in a couple of hospitals as a visitor in the last year or so. Um, the food is pretty appalling still. Um, so sadly, nobody took her up on her suggestions, but the cookbook itself is fascinating. Okay. Who has more questions? This is so much fun. I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. I did say food history happy hour. So my plan was to go for an hour. Um, but if you're bored, just let me know. Nobody has any questions. Can you guys hear me okay? I feel like I'm talking pretty loudly, but I'm also kind of far away from my computer, so. Silence. Yeah, this definitely needs more cream. It is good, though. Oh, okay, faster. Hospital has good food. That's good to know, Glenn. Upstate hospitals do not. Nope. No, they do not. Ooh, Andy, when did powdered lemonade become a thing? And what's a food way? <laughs> oh, man, food ways. Food way is kind of a catch-all term for, um, like, cuisine, basically, but it includes... Um, that's a really good idea, Glenn. I'm totally going to add more cream right now. Um, <laughs> food ways include sort of not just the food itself, but how it's prepared and, you know, where it's grown, all that kind of stuff. All right, Glenn, I'm adding more cream at your suggestion. I like it better with more cream. It mellows out the lemon juice a little bit more. Um... So I hope that answers your question, Candy, about food waste. What else did you ask? Let me scroll up because people are talking, which is fantastic. Oh, powdered lemonade. Okay, so my understanding is that powdered lemonade comes out of World War II with many processed foods. Um, and it has to do with the development of citric acid, which is actually a petroleum product, believe it or not. Most people don't know that, but... Um, yeah, I think it comes out of trying to make food for soldiers. Okay, Ian asks um, via Becca, <laughs> uh, when did the flip become popular and when did it die out? I assume you're talking about the beverage flip. Um, my understanding is that a flip has egg white in it. I'm going to Google it to be sure. But if I, I've never had one. I've never ordered one. Um... Oh, it's a whole class of mixed drinks. Oh, mm, okay. I think there's a couple different versions. There's the hot flips, right? And then there's cold flips, it looks like. Um, well, I think the hot ones died out because we stopped having fireplaces with hot pokers, which is how you make a hot flip. And the cold ones, um, yeah, the cold ones have egg raw egg in them, which is, I think, why that died out. We started realizing that raw eggs could give you salmonella because of how we raise our chickens. Um, so fancy cocktail places that specialize in historic cocktails, you can still get a flip. Um, but I think people are too freaked out by the raw egg these days. So uh, let's see. I missed some questions here. <laughs> 
Erin, how do you know so much about what your local hospital has? Has the best sweet potatoes there like candy? That seems like maybe not the best thing to me serving in a hospital. Um, oh, good question, Andy. Andy says, in addition to invalid cookery, how did World War I? Whoops. Ah, go away. Sorry. How did World War I influence the kinds of foods and cuisines that are popular in, say, the 1920s? Um, so I think World War I, you know, didn't have a huge influence on how people ate in terms of individual foods. Uh, it did have a big influence on what people ate in terms of nutrition, like the use of calories really came to the fore during World War One, so it became very popular to order, you know, a restaurant, oh, I'll have 100 calories of this, I'll have 100 calories of that, you know, very pretentious, rich person kind of thing to do. Um, but I think the biggest influence on food in the 1920s was really, um, you know, the soldiers and nurses and people who'd been abroad and experienced um, maybe some of the local cuisines abroad, um, immigrant foodways became a little bit more acceptable in the 20s. Uh, I think in part because more Americans had been abroad, more working class Americans had been abroad. Um, but also because, excuse me, um, you know, kind of slumming and eating in immigrant neighborhoods and eating publicly in restaurants was sort of a rebellion against uh, the stuffier aspects of progressive era society. Um, so that kind of plays into the whole flapper thing, you know, going to spaghetti houses and, you know, Chinese food restaurants and other kind of low class eating places became very popular in the 1920s. Um, I think in reaction to um, kind of the social mores of the time. And I feel like I'm missing other people's questions. So I'm gonna scroll down again. Hi, Linda. Thanks for joining us. Oh, egg creams. Egg creams is so funny because they don't really have eggs in them, right? It's just soda. Um, and just soda and syrup, I think, right? Let me double check. I've only had an egg cream like once or twice, sadly. I know, but it's definitely more of an East Coast thing than it is um, a Midwestern thing. Okay, milk and soda water flavored with syrup, um, which sounds like it would be terrible, but it's not. I recommend it. <laughs> oh, Amanda, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell you about Aspic. I did a whole interview last fall, I think with somebody who was writing an article on the history of Jell-O. I'm gonna take a drink because I'm getting parched. Um, and they talked about, I had to talk to them about the history of Aspic. So Aspic dates back, way back, basically as, as far back as people were boiling bones, they were basically making Aspic. So if you've ever made chicken stock from bone in chicken and then put it in the fridge overnight, it turns into jelly, right? Which most modern Americans find disgusting, I think. Um, I do not enjoy savory gelatinous foods, as many Americans do not. Um, sweet gelatinous foods are delicious. Uh, savory ones though, not my favorite, uh, but basically Aspic was a luxury food um, because you had to have a large quantity of meat bones on hand. You had to boil them for quite a long time, um, which stank because they were using beef bones largely, sometimes pork bones. Have you ever heard of calf's foot jelly? It's a jelly made from the feet of baby cows, right? And it makes a gelatin. That's why it's a jelly. Um, but so you had to boil it and then you had to strain it because you wanted it to be clear. Um, and then it was usually used to 
you know, make molded jellies. It became very popular during the Victorian period. Um, jellies of all kinds, usually fruit, but not always. You'd have um, uh, meat flavored aspects. Uh, and then, of course, in the late 19th century, you got the development of commercially produced gelatin, which was way easier for people to use. It was odorless, which was great. So it's much more versatile. Um, and that's when you get, you know, Knox gelatin, Jello, um, and Junket, or a Danish dessert from Christian Hansen Laboratories, all three of which companies started in New York, by the way. I bet you didn't know that. I only know about Christian Hansen Laboratories uh, because of my mom, who was looking at a box of Danish dessert and saw that Christian Hansen Laboratories was in Little Falls, New York, which is where my uh, husband's family is from. <laughs> um, but Knox Gelatin, I don't remember where that's from, but uh, Jell-O is in Leroy, New York. They actually have a Jell-O museum there. Um, and then, of course, in the 1950s, we have aspects up the wazoo because we start to get um, just obsessed with molded salads. That's something that dates back, actually, to the turn of the 20th century, that molded salads, gelatin salads, um, either sweet or savory, Sorry, it's a little alert there. Uh, we're seen as very dainty and ladylike and upper class. Um, so ladies who lunch and ladies who play bridge and have tea started to have molded salads. Um, I don't know what was going on in the 1950s, if we were just so starved for variety after World War II or what, but there are some pretty horrible monstrosities of gelatin salads out there. Uh, I think a couple people have mentioned them. Oh, yes, Aaron mentioned hot dog and SpaghettiO aspic, which sounds horrific to me. Um, although I think I might be persuaded to eat, there's a couple of um, tomato based, tomato juice based gelatin salads that don't have fruit in them <laughs> um, that seem like they would probably taste like a solid Bloody Mary which I would probably go for. Um, it's the mixing of, you know, mayonnaise and vegetables and fruit flavored gelatin or with fruit, you know, the very classic, what is the Prairie Home Companion? Uh, lime, jello, marshmallow, cottage cheese surprise. That's not really something that I want to eat. Um, Chad did mention uh, head cheese. Head cheese is a type of meat-based aspic. If you've ever had scrapple, that's basically, you know, bits of pork in aspic with cornmeal that then solidifies overnight and you slice it. Um, oh, Amanda has made one with vinegar, pepper, and fake crab meat served on romaine lettuce. I mean, I kind of feel like aspic and jello it's like go with the fruit or go like all meat and vegetable don't combine them it's the combination that gets really awful so i hope that was enough on aspect the meals have any other questions this is super fun you guys we've been talking for like 40 minutes this is great unfortunately my drink says you're supposed to drink it while fizzy and it's not really that fizzy anymore, but that's okay. It's not bad. I'm still drinking it. Anybody else have any other questions? Chad, you made the SpaghettiO one. Oh my gosh. And Aaron sent a cranberry mayonnaise gelatin. Kate says country song lyrics about Aspic. I'm not going to do that. I wrote a little country song one time for Kate, and she's never going to let me forget it, I don't think. Um, Glenn wants me to repeat the cocktail recipe, which I totally will. And as a reminder, it is linked in um, the event that hopefully most of you saw, the Food, Histor the food History Happy Hour live stream event, uh, which is an ongoing thing. You can see it on my page, The Food Historian on Facebook. So I did write down the recipe. So this drink is called Hoffman House Fizz. It's 
from a 1912 um, bartender's guide from a restaurant called Hoffman House. Not the Hoffman House at Kingston, New York, as far as I can tell. So it calls for a juice of half a lemon, a half a teaspoon of powdered sugar, probably could be a little more, um, one jigger of Plymouth gin, which is not the same as London dry gin. You want to get an American gin or a Plymouth gin. Um, a teaspoon of cream, uh, and then you shake it over ice, and you pour it simultaneously um, with plain or lemon lime seltzer, which is what I used. So that's the recipe. Chad Wallach is a braver man than I. He says he's made a head cheese from a whole pig head. I love food history. Not as interested in recreating historical recipes as maybe I could be because don't really want a whole pig's head in my not very big kitchen. <laughs> oh, let's see. Aaron says, it might take a second to process this, but it's an ad from 1960 that includes a recipe for edible candles made out of mayonnaise and canned cranberry sauce and gelatin that you're supposed to both light on fire and eat. That sounds terrifying on basically every front. That must be that link you sent me, huh, Aaron? I'll have to check it out later. You guys find the weirdest stuff. I thought you were gonna ask me more normal food history questions. <laughs> but hey, we can talk about alcohol and aspic and prohibition and invalid. Amanda, you should totally write an aspic song. P please write a song about aspic. You know, since I wrote, Oh, hot dog in the window. The straw is metal. Yes, it's a metal straw. Chad says do it. I, If you write a song about aspic, Amanda, we can maybe like Zoom sing it together. I would totally do that. Yep. Be the food historian music hour instead of the food historian happy hour. Chad, you're just saying awful? <laughs> is that an offer or are you asking me to talk about awful? <laughs> uh, or are you making song lyric suggestions? Write it down, Amanda. And yes, it's metal because it makes a noise. Um, I don't have any regular straws and highballs always feel nicer, I think when you have a straw. It's also much easier to drink on camera. Anybody else have any other questions? Hmm, Andy, you're coming up with all the good questions this time. Good job. Andy asks, when did Swedish meatballs become a thing? And are they in fact Swedish? And if not, why does Ikea sell that? Um, so, oh no, camera permission denied. Okay, good, there we go. That was weird. I didn't deny permission to use my camera. Um, Swedish meatballs are, as far as I know, actually Swedish. Um, they've been around in Sweden for kind of a while. Uh, they're basically ground meat of any kind. Most people in the United States use beef, but in Sweden, I wouldn't be surprised if they originally used mutton. Um, and they have some of the sweet spices in them, like cinnamon, that kind of stuff, uh, which is very medieval and force meat, which is basically meatballs, um, dates back to Roman times and even earlier. Um, how do I know that? Because I did an interview about meatballs one time. <laughs> All this random knowledge in my head. Um, so yeah, I have a feeling that they're pretty old in, in, as, as far as the cuisine goes. Um, but they didn't really become popular in the United States until after World War II, um, in part because after World War II, Americans got really interested in European peasant cuisines. Um, including Swedish food and smorgasbord, smorgasbord, right? 
Um, and also they're really easy. It's basically a slightly different meatball in a cream gravy. They're delicious. Um, and that's why Ikea sells billions of them every year. Oh, thank you, mom. Hi, mom. Mom is correcting me. She said it's not cinnamon, it's nutmeg in Swedish meatballs. Um, so yeah, and she would know because she married a Swede. <laughs> or half sweet anyway. Uh, but yeah, nutmeg is a sweet spice. So, um, although not around in medieval Europe, so maybe I'm wrong on this, but definitely been around for a while. Any other questions? I need these songs too. Chad, get cracking, Amanda. I need food-related vegetable and aspic songs. Okay, people, we got 15 minutes left. I'm a very slow drinker, I realize. Let's talk about how good Ikea's lingonberry juice is, Erin. I do love it. I don't know if anybody's ever had the elderflower soft. It's called soft is um, Swedish and or Norwegian for um, flavored syrups that you add to water. It's very similar to a soft drink that we call them here in the United States. Um, but it is delicious. Lingonberries are related to cranberries. They're native to Northern Europe. Um, elderflowers are flowers <laughs> of the elder tree or the elderberry tree. Um, elderflower soft is a little floral for me. I'm not a huge uh, fan of florally foods, um, but the lingonberry juice is delicious. I would agree with that. But I like cranberry juice too, so they're not that different. Maybe my next cocktail will have to have cranberry juice in it. And we can talk about the great cranberry scandal of the 1960s. That can be our next talk. Anybody else have any other questions? You can also ask questions ahead of time for future talks, um, which will let me do more research in advance, which would be great. Because sadly, although I know a lot about food history, I'm not food history Google. And I use Google a lot when people ask me specific questions. Um, Ooh, Andy says, when did high fructose corn syrup become a thing? Is it all a response to the U.S. embargo on Cuban sugar? Or is that just my brain seeing patterns where none exist? Um, I'm not exactly sure when high fructose corn syrup becomes a thing, but corn syrup is definitely around um, at the turn of the century, and it was actually kind of came into its own during World War I, in part because there was sugar rationing. Sugar was the only... Uh, food stuff that was officially rationed for individual households, uh, although it was not rationed until the end um, of the war, basically until the fall of 1918. Um, up until that point, all rationing in the United States was voluntary, which had mixed results. Um, and interestingly enough, during World War I, uh, the United States government basically leaned on Cuba and bought up its entire sugar harvest um, for not really a fair market price because um, that's what the United States likes to do in Central America. Um, but yeah, so we had all of Cuba's sugar anyway during World War One. Um, I'm guessing that high fructose corn syrup is developed during World War II, as many of our um, many of our industrial foods are. Just googling here for a minute. Yep, 1957 is when we create high fructose corn syrup. I actually just watched a very interesting little documentary um, on Amazon called Bottled Up, I believe is the name of it, and it is about um, Dublin Dr. Pepper from Dublin, Texas, uh, which is considered the home of Dr. Pepper. 
soda pop. And uh, there was a manufacturing plant that was producing it uh, with cane sugar in original glass bottles until quite recently when Dr. Pepper Corporate, which made the switch to high fructose corn syrup a long time ago, decided that they did not want an independent bottler to be selling um, cane sugar based soda. So if you want to check it out. It's on Amazon Prime. It's included with Amazon Prime. It's called Bottled Up, pretty sure. The Dublin Dr. Pepper story. Um, it's pretty good. But uh, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to look more into the high fructose corn syrup, Cuban sugar relationship, Andy, which I can do next week because I'll have the weekend to look into it. <laughs> oh, Glenn is finding some songs about aspic <laughs> that's fantastic um does anybody else have any other questions for me i will definitely talk about cranberries and scandals next week aaron we'll have a cranberry i'll find some cranberry based cocktail um although i guess that means i have to go out and buy cranberry juice i almost bought cranberry juice today i ran out to the grocery store because we were low on a lot of stuff i'm like going like once a week i wear gloves i'm being safe um but uh I might have to get some cranberry juice so we can talk about cranberry juice scandals and cranberry scandals, which would be super fun. Does anybody else have any other questions for me in the remaining nine and a half minutes of food history happy hour? This has been super fun, you guys. I'm so glad that we did this. And I assume you're making further inroads into your drink than I am. Because it's really not fizzy anymore, sadly. No? Nobody has any other questions? Erin, <laughs> I'm playing the how long can I go without shopping game. I mean, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I can't go very long. I wanted to get a real lemon. A real lemon for tonight, even though I do have bottled lemon juice. Um, and we're also running very low on cream in my household, uh, which is a real problem because <laughs> we eat a lot of cream. Yep. And milk, although more cream than milk. But, you know, got to follow those progressive era um, dietary recommendations. Milk is the perfect food, right? Ah, Chad's working down the freezer. I did the opposite. I stocked up my freezer um, with foods that are friendly for my Chad, who says he can't cook. He can totally cook, but I do all the cooking in our house. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Send Sweeney out to fetch groceries, lastly style. Well, I would, except for there's no sidewalks in our neighborhood, and she would totally get hit by a car, and that would be terrible. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sweeney Pie is our Shetland sheepdog, and she looks like Lassie, and she's adorable. And she's in another room right now because she would have spent this whole hour whining for attention, <laughs> despite the fact that I'm home every day with her now. It's never enough, so... All right, seven minutes left. It's your last chance until next week to ask your burning questions. No? You guys are killing me here. I'm gonna last 60 minutes. <laughs> okay, yes, I will introduce Sweetie Pie next week. She's pretty adorable. Um, you will love her. She's fantastic. She's pretty much the bestest dog that there is. Hmm, Andy asked me a question I have no idea how to answer about colonial blends of tea. Oh, Matthew says, what are the best foods for this shelter in place? Um, I love 
canned beans and dried lentils because they're super versatile um, and sweet potatoes uh, because with sweet potatoes and beans, you can make a whole lot of cool stuff. Um, I love to make um, sweet potato hash with peppers and onions and black beans. And if I've got it, some uh, spicy chorizo on top, that's pretty fantastic. Um, you guys are asking me all these questions. I'm just going to keep going then. We're going to be longer than an hour. Um, but I also really love lentils. If you've got root vegetables and you roast them and you make some lentils, I like French puy lentils with bay leaf and then you make a vinaigrette. It's fantastic and actually healthy, healthy for you. Yes, Hop and John. Yep, that's also delicious with uh, black eyed peas or you can make it with any kind of field peas, but um, unless you live in the South, uh, you don't get a ton of uh, access, anything but black eyed peas. Um, <laughs> beans are delicious, you guys. Beans are so, so underrated. Um, they're shelf stable, they have a lot of good protein. They're, if they're canned, all you have to do is open up a can and heat them up. You don't actually have to cook them. Um, so I think people who don't like beans have only had really sad beans, right? Like just plain beans. That's no good. You gotta put stuff in them. Or worse, baked beans. A lot of people do not like baked beans. Might be a texture thing. Some people don't like the mushy, mushy texture, in which case I recommend lentils. Uh, I made lentil sloppy joes the other day. That was fantastic. And then I put the leftovers on top of nachos. That was the best idea ever. <laughs> um, okay, did I miss a question? I think I might have missed a question. Oh, you're welcome, Carla. Um, Becca asked, when did bananas stop being a luxury item? Um, when Central America started producing a lot more of them. Uh, another interesting thing is that the bananas that we eat now are not the bananas that were common at the turn of the century. The Cavendish banana um, is now functionally extinct. Might even be actually extinct. Um, and there are some people who theorize that artificial banana flavor, which if anybody has ever had, say, banana Laffy Taffy <laughs> or something like that, artificial banana flavor does not taste like modern bananas. Um, but there's some people who theorize that they did taste like Cavendish bananas, which I guess would make sense, but I'm like, why would they update it? Not sure. Um, but our current bananas, I don't know the varietal name of our current bananas, but they are also in danger of becoming extinct, uh, because they tend to be monocropped, um, and they're pretty overbred, uh, so they're very susceptible to disease. So your grandkids might not be able to have the same bananas that you did either. Um, so yeah, and I, I ran across an interesting, um, I'm on Instagram now, if anybody wants to follow me on Instagram at Preserver Parish, um, but there's a couple of really great food historians on Instagram, one of whom does the history of food in World War II, mostly in World War II Britain, uh, and she wrote a fascinating post about um, children who had never had a banana, like they didn't believe that bananas existed. Um, and then, you know, after the war, getting bananas and flipping out and like a green grocer got in like one bunch of bananas and like parsed out one banana per family with little kids so that they could, they could try a banana. So interesting stuff. Okay, well, I think I've answered most of the questions. Um, thank you so much for joining me for Food History Happy Hour. I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, although I think most of you know who I am. I'm Sarah Wasper Johnson. I'm the food historian. Um, and this has been great. And I've really enjoyed it. And it's broken up the monotony of shelter in place. And I hope you all enjoyed the cocktail. Um, and enjoyed your own cocktails. And we're totally doing this again. So 
in the last remaining 15 seconds of our history happy hour. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining me. Um, we'll do it again next Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern, um, right here on Facebook. You can follow me on The Food Historian on Facebook. You can also visit my website, foodhistorian.com. I just posted another blog post this morning, um, so I'll share it on Facebook in just a minute, but you can also go to the directly to the website for checking it out. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Gabrielle. Michael thinks the juicer looks like the Van de Graaff generator? A little bit. I think it looks more like Alien, right? Alien versus Predator from the movie. <laughs> anyway, all right, time to go. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining me, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.